first off, I just want to thank you all for coming. So uh, part of Launch Space is connecting a lot of entrepreneurs with people who have you know, made the entrepreneurship jump or they're thinking about it or they've kind of been exploring the idea. And so powered by Rolf and Mark Hogan, and essentially it's a chance for you to hear firsthand about what it takes to become an entrepreneur, what to do, some of the mistakes to maybe avoid unless you want to make them again, but then you can come and you'll be able to tell your story here pretty quick. So what we'll do is uh, we can jump right in. So we're here with Luke Legault. Who runs one? <laughs> runs the Wandering Bison. There you go. And uh, yeah, you can tell you a bit about it. So I guess we can just uh, first off just tell us a bit about yourself and yeah, and yeah. In. Well, first off, thanks for making time. We made food. You guys are supposed to eat it. It's not just for show. So make sure you jump in on that. But otherwise, yeah, I'm three years and a couple months into this business here. But in terms of cooking, it's been. 15, 16 years that I've been doing that, all the way from Ontario to Alberta to BC to the north. Coming here, this has been, it kind of formed out a necessity for needing to make sure that I was actually still happy cooking, because being in the north is one of those things where if you're not doing your own, you're doing for someone else, and if you're doing for someone else, you kind of have to follow their rules, which works sometimes, but for the most part, it's not really ideal for someone like me who, I don't really like following a lot of the rules. So when I came up here, I helped open the wheelhouse. That was my first sous chef job in the north. Loved it, but it was something where, again, just following the rules of what we were supposed to have, what we were supposed to do, and how we were supposed to structure our days didn't really feel as great. So the Wandering Bison itself, in terms of the entrepreneur roller coaster, it's been something where started with one plan and direction pretty much due to public interest that got pushed aside and now i'm almost exclusively catering with trying to go back into where we first started which was barbecue sauces mustards bacon pulled pork stuff like that all done local high end a little bit better than what the sort of normal piece is but i mean catering wise it's just been incredible it's been three years of doing stuff i never thought i'd be able to do and cooking for people i never thought i'd even see firsthand let alone cook food for so yeah it's been a hell of a lot of fun as far as the catering business and what we'll do is uh, i'll ask luke some questions but if you guys think of anything you want to ask feel free to just throw your hand up and you can ask him as well and interactive so we'll kind of go that way uh, your background you also have a bit of kind of that the technical sense of cooking as well because you had done your schooling is in the costing and stuff like that and maybe explore that a little bit and just how that plays into your business now pretty much so Culinary is a diploma-based program. It's not a degree, but what it is is that anybody can do it. The education system is divided into two sides of you can either do the blitz of an education, which is a little bit more on the college side, what's taught up here, where it's between eight and nine months of cooking hands-on. You're not really doing too much in terms of the costing, the controlling, the yield percentages, all that break apart. For me, I did a two-year culinary program at George Brown in Toronto. That taught me a lot about menu cost controls, looking at the science between like, we all do it so naturally, but is the menu open like a book? Is it a trifold? Is it a single piece? They do eye tracking with uh, laser movement on where your eye moves on the menu. So you know where to place a uh, very expensive, but very high uh, yield item or the one that you're not really wanting to sell too much of that you know everybody's gonna order anyway, you put Caesar salad down in the bottom left. And you do these things where it's always about how do we subconsciously get into a world where we're not trying to force into anything, but we are trying to hope that we can steer a little bit. So there's a big difference between yield percentage, cost percentage, and sort of food numbers where in a restaurant, you're hoping to be able to get one third of everything. So when you go and you eat at a place like Antoinette's or, uh, you know, even some place like Boston Pizza, they're looking at a menu price is 30% of profit, 30% of labor, and 30% of food cost. And in that remaining 10%, that's where you're supposed to pay all your overheads and all of your extra pieces. Every day is a fight where a fridge breaks down and now your 10% is actually 15 or people don't show up. So now your labor cost is really low, but the people who are there burning out because they've just been running too hard. So for catering world, it's, it's very different in that on the technical side of things, I wake up in the morning and I know what I'm doing. So I knew this is what I was making today around how many people were going to show up and around what we were going to sort of source and do. 
if I were in a restaurant, I'd have to be prepared for if 200 show up, but I'd have to have price points for if only 20 show up. So you have to run these numbers and, and, and pretty much it's just a game of a daily basis of how do you source what you want to source? How do you do what you want to do? But how do you not go bankrupt because of how doing it the right way is expensive versus doing it the frozen box way where you don't care if somebody shows up or not because it's all in the freezer anyway. And you pull it out when you need it. And did you have to defrost a little bit more because extra people showed up? Well, cool versus, I mean, before in the summertime when the fireweed markets open, I do a lot of weddings every Saturday, pretty much all the way through the middle of May until the middle of September. Every Thursday, I'm at the fireweed market, buying the best that I can, connecting with the farmers, sorting out what it is that I can get as much as I can from right there on the doorstep. And that's where it's really nice for catering because I know how many people are going to show up at a wedding, give or take. You know, there's always the, the wild cards, but yeah. So for yield percentages and running numbers, that's pretty much, I love to cook. But a lot of my time spent doing calculations in terms of how much something costs per pound, how much yield you get out of it. Now, how, does it, how much does it cost per pound on how much you end up with, whether or not your labor cost on the prepping of that balances out for the actual sort of money saved on the finished product versus money saved on the end result. And then you go through and maybe there's a, like even for example, onions, just say you buy a 10 pound bag for 10 bucks and you can buy a 10 pound finished product for 15, well, if your yield percentage is off, then it's actually cheaper to buy the finished product than it is to buy the ready-made or the untouched product. So yeah, these are, being in the culinary world makes me so happy. I wake up in the morning and I go to sleep at night with this on my mind. And, but the food is sort of taking a little bit of a it's always there, but looking at even the table right there behind you guys, I know how much each one of those items costs on a per person and per portion basis. I know what I can source locally versus what I can't. If I can't source it locally, it's still traceable. And if I can't trace it, then it doesn't get used. So it's something where this is the technical side that my culinary education taught me. But at the same time, that's the passion that comes from being able to know that you're doing something right versus a, hey, isn't it cool to cook? And you go, yeah, I love not seeing my wife and not being home until midnight. Yeah. And on that, because you mentioned a little bit earlier too, just doing what you want to do. And I guess as far as, you know, balancing that cost versus being creative with the food, can you talk a bit about your oh, restaurant? Yeah, and maybe your restaurant experience not being able to do that and now deciding to be a bit more creative where your costs might not necessarily be there, your margins might not be there. So 30% food, 30% labor. That 30% food and 30% labor comes from the idea that you don't know what's coming. So you can't plan on having, like some of the dishes are, when you have a full menu, you rely on some lost leaders where you know that people aren't going to pay your total value on the steak, but you know that you'll make that up on something like a soup. Whereas for me, I know that spending more on local and traceable is really meaningful where my numbers are actually a lot more to the 45% on food and the 15% on labor. Because I can plan ahead, I know how many servers I need, how many cooks I need, how many pieces I need. And I can run with the idea that the better product is always the better choice versus in the restaurants it was, we want to use a really great product. We've got this local guy growing beans, they're $2 more per pound, let's get some. The answer is no, because there go our margins and there go our, our, our skews. So for being able to do what I want, the, the thing that I enjoy is that I will never hide from a question about where something comes from or why I would use that over a different one. And you see me shopping at the grocery stores, you know, look in my cart. It's, there are no no names. There are no other random pieces. It's all traceable if you don't see something in my cart, but you see it on a menu, it's because I was able to get it locally. And doing the shopping in the moment is also really wonderful because then these menus where I write that I will just get the best I possibly can of grilled veg or lettuces or fruits or that type of thing, it makes it so I'm more flexible where a restaurant doesn't have the luxury of doing that. I, I can either say that I will always get an item and then have to use it even if it's crap, or I can just say that I always get the best item and never really articulate what it is until in the moment. And I mean, that's the nicest part where I don't have to compromise on whether or not I'm proud of something. It's, 
I see very clearly in my emotions when I'm in a really rough headspace, I can't cook worse shit. It's really bad. <laughs> Bread doesn't rise, cookies fall apart, uh, soup tastes boring and bland, but when I'm in a good headspace, I feel great, and my headspace gets improved the second that I get to use something really amazing, something territory grown, something when an apple smells like an apple versus when a strawberry smells like an apple. There's there's this difference, and I know that it's different up here with how long a truck takes and food security and all that kind of thing, but really it's about I don't have to buy strawberries that look like a strawberry but taste like an apple because there's no flavor left. I can just say that I'm not using those, and instead we'll go to, holy crap, those are really good blackberries that came from D.C. or something. So, yeah, it's... I feel like I don't have to compromise as much on my integrity when I'm working for me than when I was working in a restaurant and still had to answer to somebody who was like, hey, by the way, you guys are supposed to achieve a lot more with a lot less, so you should get on it. So, yeah, that's, I don't miss that at all. So if we take then, you've decided to leave the restaurant industry, you don't want to cook someone else's food, so you go to the Wandering Bison, and I guess walk us through how that idea started, what it first started out as, and then how it evolved to where you're at now. Where, yeah. I don't know what the main goal of starting a business is, aside from try not to go crazy, but <laughs> it was something where I was cooking at exploration camps where fly in, fly out, helicopter for 20 minutes and be in the middle of the bush cooking off a generator in a wall tent. It's awesome, but I'm gone for four to six weeks at a time. And so it was something where while Erin's at home, she's very skillful with sides or quick little sautés of veg or something like that, but the proteins were missing. Original Bison idea was compete with M&M &M meat shops, utilizing local, doing fresh, using what I can from around here, all pronounceable and, and simple versus an ingredient list that long, and hopefully you could pronounce half. So that's where it started. And then it went to barbecue sauces and mustards, which were always a passion. Uh, I love deep south barbecue, where it's it's not all about white sauce or mustard sauce or that kind of stuff. It's like the, the classic ketchup sauce, like a bullseye, but just done really well. Yeah. And so when I was at Independent doing a, uh, a vendor day, I got approached about the idea of do you cater? And you're a new guy, so you say yes to everything because who knows when the next thing's coming along. And that ended up being that I put a quote and a bid in for the Premier's Conference. And that was pretty intense because when I was in Vancouver, I was working for hotels like the Pan Pacific and the Hotel Vancouver. These really big ones where we had, we had contracts where we cooked for the entire NHL. Every team that came through Vancouver, we cooked for them. And we had very specific dietary needs. And, and to the extent of this many sweet potatoes, this weight of pasta, this style of chicken breast done this way, steaks done with this much, but not that much. And so pulling it through, this worked really well for me when doing up a matrix for how the premiers, their plus 200 extra people, keeping it organized, keeping it pieced together, that that world spread very easily into this new one and I mean it sort of went from there where I still love the barbecue sauces and the mustards and making bacon from scratch and using all these locals but the catering once I did that one that snowballed into I was at that event can you do this one that went into hey Will and Kate are coming can you cook the food for Will and Kate that went into hey we're getting married can you do 200 person wedding uh, did a 190 person, four day, five meals a day event over last summer, which was insane using as much local. We, they went through, so this is a, a group of doctors and physiatrists who are meeting all over the world. They went through for 150 people, they went through about 150 pounds of salmon. It was almost a full pound of salmon per person because this is what they wanted. So they were, they were literally going to the buffet and taking a half side of salmon per person it's it's the way it goes sometimes and so that made it that like during that event Teresa was there with me josh was there with me everybody like all hands uh my fitbit told me i pretty much walked to haynes junction in that <laughs> five day period so it's that's what you do aaron knows i was 
I was actually physically at the KDCC from 5 a.m. until midnight, all the way through that. And it was sadistically invigorating, let's say. <laughs> so yeah, it's, it's something where you, you, you do it because you love it, right? And so that just sort of snowballs and turns and turns into something where when you, when you wake up knowing that you get to do what you wanna do, then yeah, the long days start meaning less and less and the late nights start being something where you still have energy to come home and, and do something fun. It's not quite so damaging to you personally when you get to do what you want versus the glorious world of doing for someone, always doing what they want, watching them walk out early, watching them have that life on the weekend where you weren't able to take the time off because they already had it. Yeah. So yeah, it's, it's progressed there. And now um, we sort of talked that I went as far as I could in the first year of me working 20 plus hours a day and we took the next step of hiring Teresa on full time so that now I'm sort of in the second tier, but on the bottom. So I, I kind of, I dropped a little bit in terms of what I'm taking on, what I'm doing, what I'm organizing, what we're piecing together. But now I have greater growth potential because I was at the absolute. I couldn't do any more. Running full tilt. Running full tilt, making myself sick, not, not eating well, losing weight, doing all that kind of stuff. And it was mentally great, but not physically physically it took a little bit of a toll so so speaking of uh some stress then let's also talk about money and as far as you know buying the stuff needed to actually start running a catering business start running your barbecue sauces and stuff like that what sort of capital did you tap into or what were those initial expenses like to kind of build stuff up that way well that's the thing um so eddie and andrew and brian are awesome guys but opening a restaurant in this town especially it's it's a lot. And the reason why it's a lot is because lease rates in this town are just crazy intense. Restaurants who fail, which has happened in this town, uh, it seems like they just drive a truck through their kitchen on the way out the door and they just smash everything up. And, and the used equipment that you can get really isn't worth all the time that it would take to fix it up afterwards. So in comparison, what I have at my house in Porter Creek is we had an existing outbuilding we paid to get Arctic backhoe to blow apart the foundation of the house, dig a big trench through the driveway and put water out there. Otherwise, two health code requirements are everything has to be cooked on a non-porous surface, easily sanitized, and everything needs to be stored at proper temperatures. Residential fridges store proper temperatures. It's just that they're not used to the volume. But the nice thing is, is in this town where nobody really likes to work on weekends or in the summer or anything like that, Everybody fixes residential fridges and they're cheap versus commercial fridges. There's one guy in town. And if he doesn't really feel like coming out, he doesn't. And when he does, he does a great job and it's phenomenal, but getting that side. So if I were to open a restaurant, I'd be anywhere between a half million and a million dollars easy. For me, capital startup at the Bison space where I am right now, to this day, dollars invested, it's about 40 grand. And that includes building my countertops out of plywood and then barathaning them six times over. I just bought a new uh, commercial style fridge of 48 cubic feet. So that's great. It holds for me. The great thing is, is it holds enough bacon so that I can actually, cause I, cause curing it myself means two weeks of fridge monopolization. So that side was taking over from the other thing. So between, the barbecues, the trailer, the fridge, the counters, the Arctic backhoe, the driveway, all that kind of stuff. We're around the 40 to, yeah, probably around the 50 grand. And the nice thing is about a culinary business is just say I go bankrupt. I have a lot of really cool stuff that's useful to me anyway, versus a restaurant. You're getting, you're getting pennies for plates. You're getting pennies for glasses and you're spending $10 on each glass at the start. You're lucky to get a dollar for these things afterwards. Whereas for me, we've got a fridge full of food. We've got a really big fridge, which is frankly too big for any sort of house on purpose. But at the same time, it's, it's great to have. I've got three barbecues now, which I can throw really great parties with. And you know, I, I've got some stuff where if I were to decide that I was no longer going to do this, there would be 
a little bit better on terms of a return for usable products that have a use for many more people than besides those who are in the restaurant industry. So pretty much I'd have to get rid of my sink and my deli slicer. Those are the things that most other people wouldn't have a use for. Yeah. But otherwise I got two beautiful barbecues, a trailer or this or that. Fantastic. There's enough there to, to not sink me, I guess. Yeah. And you talked about just going bankrupt and a lot of people in here might be thinking about making the jump. Yeah. and wondering what if. And one of the things that we had talked about beforehand, but you just asking yourself, you know, what if you fail? Like, what's, what's the biggest risk? And can you kind of talk a bit about your mentality in terms of making the jump? And the, uh, the jump into entrepreneurship has been the, 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 the greatest transition that I've ever had in terms of a career because what it did was it, it allowed me to really evaluate whether or not something was truly important to me or whether or not it was truly important to the business. Because having something important to the business can be useful to me, but if it's not, kind of like what I said about my food, if I don't believe in it, then there's no reason to do it. And so when you're starting up a business, every single person who you've ever had friends or relations or anything like that is going to ask you a couple questions. Most of the time they're going to ask you, why would you ever do that? Are you sure that's going to work? You've got a regular job. That will pay you well. What about your retirement? All these things. Everybody continually asks you, what if you fail? And the weirdest thing is that the bank will do it everywhere else well, but nobody ever asks you, what if you're a success? And if you're a success, are you prepared to work 150 hours a week, see your personal life and your personal pieces fall apart or disappear for a while and come back? All of those things end up being something that if you don't ask yourself about the successful side of things, then you're just going to end up being doomed to miss out on how awesome it is because failing sucks. It does. There's a lot of times where you make a decision and you go, you're an idiot. Uh, of that 50, 60 grand I've spent, I'd argue 10 was on some stupid crap that I don't use anymore. I don't need, I look at it and I go, I got to figure a place for that because yeah, it's still sitting there. But for the most part, I think that the craziest part of getting involved in something for yourself is the, it's almost confusing how quickly people embrace something when you show them how passionate you are about it versus the thing that I think we're used to is that people sit behind a computer and they try and encourage people to do what you want them to because there's this really cool picture of it. My food has no pictures because I don't have friggin' time. I take a picture, usually the picture that I get is of dessert because everything else was just so last minute on the way out the buffet or on the way out the door that there is no ability to take a picture of it. But if I were relying on what it is that generally people do is take a picture, promote this glorious life, look how happy I am because I'm an entrepreneur, isn't everything wonderful, and you go, yeah, I know what you actually did to get there. So I don't, I have my phone and that's it. That's all I take pictures with. That's all I do to be successful. It's something where I think that that's the side I'd rather be on versus I don't have, I think I have maybe like 500 Instagram followers or something like in the world like that. It, it's pretty lame. Most of the time, people who like my stuff on Facebook or something like that, they're just random friends. The reason I do this is because I have never been able to connect with people in a stronger way than when I get to do it for a meaningful event for them, be it a wedding, be it a party, be it a like in March, we have a 70th birthday. And then in April, we have an 80th birthday party being thrown. These are the reasons why being able to be passionate and love what you do versus love how, hey, I'm an entrepreneur, it ends up being something that you can actually slide in and take pride in it versus I got a cool paycheck or I get to put my own personal name on my own personal business card and hand them all out. It's a different feeling when somebody stands up at the end of the day and says, thank you to myself and my team. They really made this event possible. They're like, let's, let's thank them properly for this. So yeah, it's, it's when you wake up and you think about being an entrepreneur and you think about doing what you either already do and love or are not doing, but still love. The question is whether or not you could actually enjoy doing it for no money and then think about whether or not you could convince somebody else to pay you to do what you actually love anyway. Because right? that's, that's what you do first thing in the morning when you get up. 
you know that you have a good product, you know that you have the skill and the love and the passion and the, the ability. My main job is to convince people to spend their hard earned money that they worked hard for on what I will work hard for versus a, would you like to go to Subway and cater your, your dinner with a six foot party sub? Or would you like to do something where we will connect on a personal level? I do 100% custom menus. There is no choose this one and I'll make it. It's connect with the people, make sure that if they hate olives, there are no olives around, make sure that if they fish their own salmon, we'll use that salmon product, do all those things. And at the end of the day, yeah, there hasn't been a time in my life in terms of all of the places that I've cooked or done or you know, fancy people I've cooked for that I've been able to connect with people in the way that I do here. Right? So entrepreneurial-wise, that's the biggest thing. Nice. I think that's a great place to kind of open it up to people. So does anyone have any questions? Go for it. <laughs> the name Wandering Bison. Good question. Lost is all fuck. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, um, I was going through a transition after the wheelhouse and trying to do camp work and trying to figure out my life. And it was something where I also haven't lived in a place uh, as I've moved across Canada. I haven't lived in a place that's felt as connected as being in Whitehorse. And so when I think about Whitehorse, I know that in the Yukon we have tens of thousands of moose. We have bears and the wildlife and all this kind of thing. The quintessential animal to me is a bison. They do what they want to do because it's what they feel like doing. When you drive past them outside of Muncho Lake, because you're, as you're going past, they don't care what you're doing. They, Aaron and I went on a vacation and we borrowed a friend's uh, Ford Ranger. There's a guy walking beside, his hump's well above the top of the, the cab. And he's just, you can, you can hear his footfalls on the road. And you can just picture what this used to sound like when they were tens of thousands strong, just powering across. And so for me, I did feel lost as I knew I wanted to cook. I knew that I loved it. I went and did an early midlife crisis when I was in Vancouver. I sold real estate for two years just to make sure that I loved cooking as much as I thought I did. And once I really did realize that, it was important for me to come back to that. But in this world up here, I did feel like I was just wandering around, not, not with any goal or any true direction aside from the one core piece which was i wanted to cook and so combining those things into the animal that represents the north the freedom not the who the hell cares but just a little bit more of i will do what i want to because it works for me and when i see them they just sort of they're never in a hurry they're yes they do run they do stampede all that kind of thing but for the most part they're just happy to go about their days. So that's what I was looking for, was the way that when I need to bust my ass, I do. I go into a hurry up and wait program. When I was at the Banff Springs, that place taught me speed like crazy. It was a 770 room hotel. We did a 300 seat lounge, the bowling center, which was pizza and nachos and wings for kids. We did the spa, which was all healthy food. We did a 36 seat fine dining restaurant with uh, one of the few master sommeliers who lived in um, Alberta and there was three of us cooking the dinner time so every night was just two guys on hot and one person on cold and we made it work and so I can move when I want to but that's the thing where yeah a bison is just to me kind of like how we all have our sort of power animals or something like that that's mine so any other ones yeah when you first started, yeah. um, did you find that you had any resistance criticism? And if so, how did you get over that? So when O'Shea and Lauren and I sat together to talk about this, there was a uh, conversation we had where it's like, yeah, at the start, I had a lot more people reaching out and going, we want lunch for 20 people and we've got $15 a person. So isn't that great? Think of how many dollars you'll get. And you go, you're asking me to do what I will always do, which is source locally, pay the premium because it goes to the farmer, it goes to the person that you care about. You can see that, but you want to do it for the same price as you can go and take people to Tim Hortons. And so 
it was very strange feeling to, to be knowing that I was only going to do this business and then to turn down business because of sticking to the principle and the value of what you do. And it's a very surreal feeling to know that bills aren't being paid, but you've got to be able to stay true to that whole, this is what I believe in and I will always do. So, um, truthfully, yesterday was, uh, it was a pretty dark day. It still happens. Uh, I still have people who we love what you've got going on. This seems amazing, but we're thinking that you could just tone it down a little bit because what we'd like is dinner for this many people for $25. And it's not that, it's not that if you went to the grocery store, you couldn't do it for yourself. But in the same way that when you pay a mechanic or you pay an electrician, you're valuing the skill that they have that you may be able to do. Like I can, I can change a tire and I can switch out electrical outlets and I can do the absolute basics. I can't do it with any finesse. I can't do it with any quality and I can't do it quickly. That's why I get sort of paid or request the premiums that I do. And then in addition, I'm doing it with products that I can always be proud of. Being asked to continually compromise on it is something where um, chefs always get told, you know, we're conceited, we're dicks. We are people who just sort of bulldoze the world and say, I'm the greatest thing ever. But truthfully, you kind of have to, because if you don't, if you don't actually keep pride in whether or not you've compromised on something where I may not have bought the best butter, but it's still a good quality product, that's one thing. But if I look at those margins that I've talked about and I see that in order to reach that margin on what they're asking me to do, the only way to do it would be to completely strip away all the things that I value. That's where it's, that's where it's just a very strange and surreal feeling that you kind of have to, and I'm not the greatest at it, slow down, sit down, read what they're actually asking you to do, and then decide whether or not it's worth it. Because a lot of times it's not worth the compromise in your integrity to say that I made the, the last meal proud of, I brought it in on the budget that they wanted versus making the meal proud, like for that, that big conference, these are people who go all around the world, let alone all around Canada. And when we did that golf course event where they ate so much salmon, we got a standing ovation from these doctors because this was the best that they've ever eaten. This was the best experience they ever had. And you hold on to those high points because there's going to be a shit ton of those low points where they come to you and they say, we want you to compromise on this, which, you know, for the most part, frankly, it's not fair to say that they're they're really understanding what they're asking from you of the integrity compromise that what it truly means. But if you can hold on and remember those nice warming times where somebody said to you, this was amazing. This meant so much. You really respected what we hoped for. You really respected us. That's pretty much the, that's the thing that gets you through because otherwise you're just sitting there going, I made 20 bucks. And sure, you know, like making, making food for 200 people and, you know, you get a check for, let's just say it's, it's a hundred grand. You go, man, that was amazing. But then there's the other side where they say, I will give you 30 grand. And you go, oh my God, really? That sounds like a lot of money, but not when you pay $7 per dozen for eggs, $20 a pound for beef, this for that, that for that. You look at it and you go, I've, I got nothing, but a check mark. And those check marks aren't worth your time. They're not. It's a very strange, surreal feeling to talk to people and say, I have an event coming up and they go, wonderful. And they go, well, what are you going to do? And I'm, I'm going to lay it all out. And they go, wow, the last guy I spoke to just said they'd cook food. So it's, it's something where, again, you, you got to convince people that what you're doing is something that you believe in. Because when you, when you show people that what you believe in is something that they should value too, and it won't work for everybody, right? Some people just love the taste of McDonald's and that's fair. But if you can get them to value the taste of the local pig or the locally grown greens and the, the desire and the request is there, they're coming fewer and far between. 
you got to rely on your friends. You got to rely on the people who know you, who know your integrity, and basically just end up with that idea that it's worth believing it versus it's going to be something that it's a fad, right? Because eating local has never been more prominent. But to me, it's not a fad. If it goes away in 20 years, or even just say it, it goes away in five years, and the thing that comes up is, I don't know, Argentinian cuisine. We need Argentinian beef up here. That's the one. Or we need more kumquats on things. Those are not things that I will ever use because they're just not here. And they're not, why is it better to ship it up than to pay your farmer, pay your local, shake hands with the person who actually brought you that piece, and then be able to also, frankly, because of where we are, brag the hell out of it. Right? Because everybody expects that we've got nothing up here. They do. So to show them what we got, I, I don't know. I, I've had a few really, really tough days, a few really tough emails, a few really tough moments, but the good ones make it worthwhile. Yeah. yeah. You, you're passionate, obviously, about locally sourced. Is there products that you think could be locally sourced but aren't currently? Uh, we need we need to adjust the uh, agriculture a little bit in terms of bison. Bison, elk, the rumiids, those ones, those guys need to be up here. We get everything from Alberta. So very respectfully to Klondike Ribbon Salmon, in the summertime, people come up here, they're looking for bison. I ate bison when I was in Whitehorse. I saw them on the highway. It was great. Yeah, those guys come from Alberta farms. You know, it's something where I'd love to be able to see, because of the amount of daylight we get in the summer, greens in the summer is no problem. But we need more locally produced greens over the shoulder months that we're dealing with. I have a big greenhouse on my property. It does help. I extend my season by about a month on either side. But I don't grow enough to satisfy those weddings of 250 people where they're all, like, I, I have officially wiped out Barton Kate at times of their greens for these things. I have bought out Haynes Packing Company of salmon at other times. Um, we, frankly, just need more. And, you know, uh, if you go up to Dawson, you go and get Klondike Valley Creamery cheese. It's frigging incredible. They just can't produce enough to be able to satisfy the demand that's already here. So really, I think that the thing that we just, that I would just like to see is that anything that can be done up here should be done up here. So the cattle that we get, they grow more slowly because it's freaking cold in the winter time. So you can't get this 14 month old cow who's as big as a Calgary cow, right? It just doesn't happen. But if we can start growing things like the way that Yukon Gardens is starting to do with their vertical farming on the hydroponics, with the aquaponics that's coming into play, with all these things, we can just, we can stop caring whether or not the highway gets washed out. I think that'll be a great freaking day. <laughs> Good. Yeah. Any other ones? I guess maybe on that note, you mentioned that your first kind of catering gig was the, the premier's dinner yeah, there. That's the first big one, yeah. As far as opportunity goes in the north, we're fairly spoiled into what we're exposed to. Can you maybe just touch on that and people who might be considering opening a business up here? And although there are challenges, maybe some of the benefits too? Yeah, don't open a catering business. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. the, uh, the thing that ends up happening is that we have a lot more saturation in the market for certain businesses. Like uh, my friend Kayla, when she was opening Blackbird, she had to do her uh, her pilot study and, and you know her business plan. And looking at the number of coffee shops in Whitehorse, we're actually on par with the number of coffee shops in a city block as places like Ottawa or Calgary or these places where there's ten times the number of people in a small little core. The difference is, is that as long as what you do is you have that peace that you can maintain, that you believe in, and that people will know that if they want that, they can come to you. It's been incredible. The, yeah, the Premier's Conference. But I also cooked for the Board of Directors of the Bank of Canada. They've done the Trudeau Foundation a couple times. I've done these things where the opportunities come more frequently up here. The opportunities for large-scale operation aren't as big as if you were in Toronto or Vancouver or Calgary. But the difference is, is that these little, I don't know, these little micro explosions of activity that we get when we have 
just say like geoscience comes up, right? Well, in Vancouver with uh, Roundup, that's at the convention center. So the convention center is where it is. And at the convention center, you get your food, and then that's the end of it. Whereas here, it's the convention center, and also the Westmark, and also the local restaurants, and then also myself, and also these other things. And we do all of this things split and break apart in a lot greater way. For the Premier's Conference, it had to be closed doors. I had to be vetted for security. I had to be sourced for all of these extra pieces. And there was, there was a little bit heavier of a not just anybody yeah. type thing. But for the most part, like when these conferences and everything comes up, it's amazing about how excited people are to be up here in spite of the pushback when they first hear that they're coming north. Because, yeah, that's, that's been a conversation with quite a few of the, uh, the people who have come through. I didn't want to come. I was being forced to. But now I'm very happy that I'm here. <laughs> so, yeah, it's, it's a really amazing town. Um, I started a business that other people were already running. It wasn't even like I had a unique and beautiful idea that was exclusive. I didn't develop an app. I didn't develop a, a new type of, well, with uh, cross-country skis or, or clothing or anything like that. I opened a catering company in a town where there's already like eight of them officially, and then pretty much everybody else has running it out of their own home. So why? Because I believed in it and because I knew I could make a go doing something similar, but with that little bit extra little piece. And I mean, it's been, yeah. The fact that I'm talking to you guys is one thing, but the fact that I didn't go bankrupt and I actually have a job, that's pretty cool. And it's only been three years. Yeah. So we've got time, right? As far, maybe in that same vein too, at one point, do you think you'll ever be in a place where you're going to say, yeah, I'm going to step back and let the business run, but maybe not be as, as much of an active participant in it? Or I don't know how retirement? to do that. <laughs> I actually legit... <laughs> nice, Sunny. I think the uh, the point of opening your own business is to be able to steer, direct, and create. Um, you want to always know that the business, regardless of your input, is going to do what you want it to. Um, but doing something as personal and as fluid as cooking means that. Each month of each year, the menu changes, the food requirements are different, but also the ingredients change. So staying excited is not very difficult. The reason why I would say step away or let the business run itself is because I stopped being excited about it and instead want to be excited about some other facet. Like let's say barbecue sauces and mustards, for example, take off like crazy and I need to go on a world tour talking about how great they are. I don't know. I friggin' doubt it, but <laughs> the other side to it is that that would happen if I started to lose interest in how great what I'm currently doing is. And so far, considering the number of hours, it's only been three years, but I'd argue it's actually been closer to six or seven years. I'm not tired yet. You know, there's still, I've got menus coming up in the summertime that are absolutely brand new, never been before taking ideas from other items that I've made and putting it into a new dish or a new piece, be it like a five course plated or like a nice big buffet or using from other people. So letting a business run itself is something that I'm actually just not sure if like running a franchise type of thing like Boston Pizza or Subway, like that is so regulated and regimented that doing like what I'm doing, I don't actually see that that would be an option. Because I use local, I shop local, I sort of do everything from within the closest border that I possibly can. So opening up a, a satellite company, say, in, in Calgary, the business would no longer be this business. It would be something different. Then. So I, I don't really think that it would work for me in that way. So. More or less, the wandering by is Luke Lugo. Is Luke Lugo. <laughs> and in spite of the name, it's a misnomer. I'm not wandering. Not yeah. Anymore. So not anymore. Yeah. Any questions? Um, with the health regulations and like the city and stuff, how, how long did it take for that process? Like, was it difficult dealing with um, opening your own on your home, home base?
It was actually something that due to the history I've had in the kitchens, because I've been, so before I opened it up, I had, I had worked for, so my culinary school being two years, well, I also worked full time during that culinary. And that was at a golf course and another small restaurant while in Ontario. Leaving there and I went to the Banff Springs, really huge hotel, but still the same health requirements. Then I went to Vancouver and I worked for small and large catering companies. I helped open the Dirty Apron. I helped with the Pan Pacific or Hotel Vancouver. Everybody actually has the same health regulations. So I knew pretty well what I was getting into in terms of what uh, CFIA and the local health department were going to want. And then it was actually a little bit more on the side of convincing the neighbors that I wasn't going to impact them negatively That's by right, running. Yeah, because there was the, the city process as well. The city process through. was actually a little bit longer. Um, if you had a kitchen and you wanted to open it tomorrow, it would involve, if it were in a commercial zone, it would involve getting the health inspector out and giving you a check mark. And that check mark, you can follow the online forms and know that you're going to do it. Pretty, pretty straightforward. The difference was that because my zoning in Porter Creek was a minor home business allowable, but not a major home business, I had to go through a rezoning process that's actually exclusive to our ownership of the house. And so then what happened was the city wanted to know what I wanted to do. So I had to put a proposal in. Then they did a mail out. Thankfully, I back on the green belt. So it goes 150 meters in radius around your house. So thankfully behind the house, there's nobody to ask. So down the street, no neighbors had a problem, but going before city council, they had questions. Uh, increased garbage from all of what I was going to be doing. So to answer that question, it was, well, isn't the increased food waste going to encourage bear activity in the neighborhood because of how you back onto Greenbelt, they're more likely to come into your backyard. So to talk to that one, it's actually, poor business model to have a lot of food waste. Every scrap of food I throw away, going to the yield percentage thing, is a scrap of food that now it's costing me money. So for my food waste, everything that's not pig related, like in terms of as long as it has nothing to do with pork, goes to local pork farmers. And so then those pigs eat up that scrap. The stuff that is pork related goes into the, the bin and it goes to the city. I actually put my green bin out once once a month to once every other month. So I produce very little food waste. So after talking to the city about that, I come home and my neighbors are listening to bluegrass and butchering a moose on their back deck. And it's just on a sheet of plywood and they've got like the full moose just hanging and they're cleaning them up and I'm laughing because yeah, it's gonna be me who brings the bears into the neighborhood versus <laughs> that. And Legit, like the, the thing was, it wasn't actually a very difficult process, but it was a more lengthy process because of how everything's a checkbox, right? Everything's got to be sorted. Everything's got to be organized. Thankfully, yeah, due to my background, it was a little bit easier for me to know what I was getting into. But the health inspectors are great in that they actually do want you to open a business. It's good for everyone, right? The, a new business is going to help with jobs, with local economy, with this, with that. But the nice thing was, is that you could ask hypotheticals to them versus when I was in Vancouver, they would walk in and, oh man, they're lab coats and they're just like on a mission. We got inspected in the hotels about once every other month and they would power through that thing with their clipboard out and their temperature guns out. And if anything was amiss, you had like chef's meetings and all of these things about why would you ever have that? And it could be something simple like, Everything has to be six inches off the ground. Well, you could have had a case of tomatoes, uh, like canned tomatoes on the ground as you were getting ready to put it into dry storage, not on the ground. And then you get written up about it. And then it would go into the log and then you get infractions and you get fined. So up here, it's a lot nicer in that what they do is they're, they're working with you versus sort of against you. So yeah, honestly, it was about a four month process, start to finish, but that was also because I tried to do it in the middle of summer when council takes vacation. So yeah, it was, I got pushed a little bit because of the timing that I put it in, but no, it was probably, I would say if I did it, say this time of year, two to three months of putting things through. Uh, work life 
balance when you know that your wife is here. She is. <laughs> what, tell us about some, and, 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 and just a handful of these folks are future restaurateurs or restaurateurs now, but how do you, what, or do you do it, or you just, just how do you do it, or do you not do that? <laughs> Okay, from my point of view, we're freaking great at it. Uh, the, um, yes, from, from my side. Uh, I think that the thing that really helps out is that because I'm doing what I love, it's not so physically and mentally draining as if I were at a place where if I were working, let's just say some job that doesn't appeal to me, if I were being an electrician and I were having to do all of these long days or even just regular length days, I would come home at night and I would not be wanting to do anything. I would not want to make dinner, go out, take the dog for a walk, spend time together, do anything like that. I would just want to be done. So for our work-life balance, it's a little hectic and chaotic in the middle of summer where like last summer, for example, not including the uh, big 190 person event, we did 14 weddings between the end of May and the middle of September. So that's pretty much every single weekend. And not just a weekend, but it's about three days leading up to the weekend. Uh, Wednesday is grocery shopping, Thursday's prep and to the market, Friday's prep, Saturday's the wedding. And then Sunday's a rip apart of the kitchen because we left it a disaster so that we could spend a bit of time together. In the wintertime here, it's actually really nice and quiet. And so we try and take time now. Um, what I'm getting better at is something I learned in real estate, which is never tell somebody that you have something personal to do. Instead, tell them that you have al already an appointment scheduled. So that an appointment can be personal time with the wife or a dog walk or something like that. People don't respect the idea of you going to watch your kids play, but they respect the idea of, oh, you already have an appointment scheduled. And so then that type of thing, it's an appointment for you. It's in your book. It says that you will do this at this time because it's what's important. So cooking dinner with Aaron or sitting out on the back deck in the middle of the day where I've got an hour because we prepped up and we're looking good. You take those little micro times where you can and sort of let them know you appreciate when you can, not just like the whole Valentine's Day and flowers or an anniversary or something like that. If you do it in little pieces as often as you can it, it's I'll find out later if I'm accurate but I think it I think it works Why wait until later let's just ask her now <laughs> Jared yeah um, yeah you, you, you kind of already talked a bit about the sort of um, getting the business franchise in order but I'm curious about you may have already spoken to this I'm sorry but um, the other ideas of growing the business in terms of creating a product that maybe would be shelf stable that you could sell or export that would be, you know, still carry the essence of what's important to use in some sort of, is that, is that interesting to you in terms of whatever it's a, a bottle of barbecue sauce or whatever, whatever it sure. be. And then the other one would be like, you know, any thoughts about, you know, creating an actual retail spot, a restaurant, um, and, 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 and doing that either in addition or in a, in a like, just curious about it. I love what you're doing. Really no, no, no. I, I don't take your question that way. Don't worry. Uh, in terms of going to the CFIA guideline, uh, Canadian Food Inspection Agency, uh, in order to ship anything across the border, it has to be federally versus territorially inspected. That federal inspection is insanely expensive. Now, because I would be shipping a food product versus something like coffee yeah. or Freeport Jenny's tinctures or stuff like that, those things aren't considered food, so they can ship without any extra pieces. Because I'd be doing food, it would be very crippling to pay the financial piece because the financial piece would all be on me. And we're talking north of about forty-five dollars to $55,000 to get it inspected at the start. And then you have to keep up with those inspections. So you got to go huge. You got to go huge to make it worthwhile. Now, the difference is you go huge because you have the infrastructure. So do you get it inspected first before you have infrastructure, knowing that you're going to be able to be popular or do you pay the money to go get that infrastructure hoping that you'll be popular enough to make it worthwhile and that's where for me like uh so at the start what we talked about it's around the fifty thousand dollars that i paid year or inception to date for the creation of this business starting a restaurant the expenses are continual 
but they're also just they, they seem to renew every day with this randomness that you didn't expect. And then all of a sudden, it's like, hell, this happened, right? I can, because I know when my events are and because I know how things are going, I can deal if a fridge goes down because I can organize and know whether or not it's the priority it truly is. If I were to open a restaurant on top of, because just say it's this big in culinary school for my management side it's every square foot either makes you or costs you money and that square foot goes right from the ground to the ceiling so are you utilizing your real estate are you making sure that your values are what they need to do because hallways and walkways and things like that they don't make you money but they have to exist so say you're only 300 square feet of a restaurant that's a good size you're good to go but for that 300 square feet 150 or hallways now instead of making you a dollar and you're good to go every space actually needs to make you two dollars but then your electricity and your extra so now you're up to three dollars a square foot now you're at your lease so you're at like 150 dollars a square foot every day that you start these numbers just keep on piling and piling versus for me operating the way that i do essentially i've just increased the equity value of my home i've made it so i can put a suite outside and I've made it so that if I want to, I can lease out that kitchen to somebody else versus to run a restaurant. I sometimes really miss it. I get lonely. I, I exist in the kitchen unless Teresa's is there. It's just me. Aaron goes to work. I can talk to Colby, my dog, but other than that, there's no one else around. Uh, I miss the restaurant for that, knowing that somebody was coming in, knowing that there would be this smiling or not smiling face walking through the door going what are we up to today let's talk about what we're going to make happen what we're going to create whether or not something great existed at the market you didn't expect and now you're going to use that to to give up on the freedom that is if i'm not busy at the bison kitchen i can work from in the house i can take colby for a walk in the middle of the day i can do these things that invigorate me and honestly like for opening your own business, everything becomes a business expense, right? Your computer, sure. My knives and my fridges, sure. But I'd also argue that some of the menus that I create actually only exist because I took Colby for a walk in the woods. And I put on my hiking boots and I, walk, I went walking around. Those things are as integral to me as my knife in terms of my boots to be able to go out. I'll pick juniper berries off the side of Grey Mountain. Being able to do those things versus not being stuck per se, but just having to be at a restaurant, even when it's not busy, or even when you're closed, or even when you're just in a prep world because something's coming up. I don't, for right now, and this is me talking today versus in two years, right? But for me right now, I don't really see that the way I'd like to do it is a restaurant. Um, if you guys have been to Vancouver and gone to the Dirty Apron, I helped open that cooking school and that's what I'd like to do instead. They have a delicatessen where they make a lot of their stuff, almost all of it from scratch in house all the time. They put on cooking classes with people who come in who want to learn. It's not necessarily for people who already have a cooking background. We would do it for the hockey wives when their husbands were playing the game and they're bored of watching their guys play. So they come and they do their cooking classes with us. Doing something like that where I can still connect on a personal level is also really important because being in the back, even if it's an open kitchen, still head down, maybe I get a wave on the way out the door, thanks so much, it was great, but I can't really connect with people and see the light in their eyes show up when they learn a new skill. How to, how to peel a frozen salmon in like three seconds is something where when I do private events at the houses and I show just these little skills that are common to me, simple to me, but make the scariness that is preparing dinner that much less scary. That's where I think that I'd, I'd find more passion than opening a restaurant and going from there. That's it. Maybe one more and then we'll wrap it up and then you guys, if you want, you can eat more food. Yeah, you yeah. Eat, eat some cookies. I just wanted to commend you on speaking to the fact that uh, being an entrepreneur sometimes can be lonely. I think you're the first person that's ever really hit on that point, but it is something that I myself find occasionally where 
you know, we, we distance ourselves from uh, you know, busy spaces because we need to think and we need to focus. Sure. And then we find ourselves alone a lot. Yeah. A lot, a lot, a yeah. lot of the time. But I think that uh, I don't know, you're the first person that ever really, you know, put a finger on it and say, well, yeah, that's something that actually happens. That does exist. So, I'm just kind of sad that you agree type thing right because because it, it sucks right like well, that does suck, but it does. yeah and you know like it, it's one of those things where you can still go for beers with friends yeah. right you can still go and connect with people but i think a lot of people who like just say a, a government a, a yukon government job where you're in your cubicle and that kind of stuff it's those simple interactions where somebody just walks past and says hi you know and and aaron teases me about how much is how much i'm on my phone or that kind of thing I do get those little dopamine kicks from when somebody sends me a text, either unsolicited or because they respond to what I sent. It is something where when you wake up in the morning to know whether or not you're going to see somebody is, is a strange feeling because then it's like, well, what are you going to do to make sure that that doesn't just sit on you the whole day? So, yeah. Awesome. Well, yeah, I'd like to thank you and uh, let's give Luke a round of applause for coming in and I'll now invite Lauren to say a few things for us. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron, thank you. <laughs> um, opportunities like this to hear entrepreneurs and to pick apart um, their stories for the better and the worse uh, is, is a foundational belief that we are, we are have tonight thanks to Rolf and Mark Hogan. Um, that, the, the, that family, and I say, I've said this each time, I just love the, the, the stories that the First Nation community are, are the trailblazers of entrepreneurship in the North. Um, and, and the gold rush, those guys are totally badass and all of the work that they did to create that movement. And then in, in, in all honesty with, the, with, with some other players emerging after, Rolf and Marg really pioneered um, and created what we have um, in Yukon today. So hooking up with that family in relation to what we do here at Northlight has been really exciting. We're wearing their sweatshirts. Um, events like this um, can make these stories possible and hopefully bridge the divide between the entrepreneur in you or the entrepreneur in someone you know. Um, and, and at some point on the path, um, help that fall feel a little less painful and feel have that up be a high five between you and someone like Luke. So thank you for yeah. joining us, the Hogan family. Thank Big you for time. making this possible. Um, you're awesome. Thank you for, for having facilitating me. <laughs> it happening. And thank you guys for coming and being interested. Next month's crazy cool story as well. Did you talk about this yet? I didn't. No. Sorry. Go for it. Okay. It's all you. So Freeport Jenny and Deborah Turner Davis. Uh, so, so Jenny from the Bitters shop and Deborah from Gourmet Spices merged to create what you may have heard as the Bonanza Box. So putting together a bunch of Yukon pieces. The business was exploding. They were making money almost right off the bat. And I saw her at the airport the other day, and she said, we're closing shop. Um, and you're going to hear the story on March 4th and exactly why. We want to be able to celebrate, like, the, what, three-year skyrocketing yeah. success story. <laughs> yeah. It's pretty quick. Um, right? And yeah. then also we want you guys to hear the stories that just didn't work out because it's part of the journey. So those guys are going to come next month. Um, and then I'm waiting on email back from Canna Store, Canna Space, for the Cannabis Place for um, uh, April. And um, Rolf and Mark themselves are the feature event for the first Thursday in May. So we are gearing up for the spring. Mark it in your calendars up until June is the last time, and we're going to give you guys a summer month off. So first weekend in June, uh, and then you have the summer off, and we'll start again in September. But yeah. thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Thank you.